Good morning. Oh, I should look that way. Good morning and welcome from Wanjak country here and I pay my respects to the Noongar elders past and present and I'm sorry I can't be there uh, to join you all. Um, and wow, how am I meant to, how am I meant to uh, follow on from the Minister of Liversack who gave such a, a, great, a great speech this morning, but I'll do my best. My job today is really to give you just an outline of what the State of the Environment Report is um, and some of the findings, which we do know uh, um, are challenging, but also to try and talk about some of the positives uh, that have come out over the last five years. So just briefly, the, what is the State of the Environment Report? Uh, and I'm sure most of you uh, already know, but it is an independent evidence-based report. It's, a, it's an assessment that comes of lots of, of lots of other people's work. So while I'm a representative of 30 odd authors who have pulled this report together, it's actually data from thousands of people right around Australia. And, and I really want to acknowledge those collaborative partnerships that come from us talking to industry, to government, to NGOs, to different bodies, Indigenous groups, to try and pull together all that information. Uh, the, the State of Environment Report comes about through the EPBC Act, which we've just heard about from the Minister, and it's released every five years. Uh, we did finish it uh, at the end of last year, and uh, we were ha very happy to have Minister Plibersek release it just, in, uh, just a month ago now. We use a standard methodology that's been used in the past, and, uh, and just to recap, it covers all of Australia, but also all of our marine environment and our external territories, including uh, Antarctica. What I wanted to do was just touch on what's new in the report, what's different from previous times. And, and what I'm pr probably the most proud of is the incorporation of Indigenous knowledge and, and a new Indigenous chapter in the report. Uh, and we have um, we had co Indigenous co-authors on just about every chapter. Uh, and what a difference that make, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. We've also included new chapters on climate and extreme events. We've tried to link to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, as often they're referred to. Uh, and one of the things that I really love about the report is we've uh, included Indigenous artworks uh, from the National Gallery in, in each of the chapters. So uh, here's the Minister releasing the report. Thank you, Minister. It was great uh, to have you do that, give it a whole lot of um, coverage and to also help to promote it and to help get those messages out. Um, as I said, it's co-authored by both scientists and Indigenous experts. And I suppose what I'm most proud of is the, diverse, the diversity of the group that produced it. And we worked together through COVID to produce it. So it was actually quite difficult. In the past, we were able to get together. In fact, a lot of us have never actually met each other in person. The Indigenous co-authorship model has been really important for this report. Uh, and I thank uh, all, the, all of the authors for their incredible um, willingness to dive in and work together to find ways of giving messages uh, about country and about science in a way that's holistic as possible. It's not perfect by any means, but it's a really good first step in that direction. Um, and we try our we tried our best to do that. We use yarning circles. Uh, we had an indigenous consultancy organisation that uh, that went and spoke to to different groups, uh, and and we use case studies uh, throughout the report. And I actually would encourage everybody to look at the indigenous chapter. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a really good um, uh, view. Of, it, of of how uh, Indigenous people in Australia look look at the environment. Just to give you an example, here's the cover of the overview, a uh, beautiful artwork, and the, one of the things we did do was include uh, Indigenous language from each of the uh, co-authors' um, country in each of the chapters. Um, so, uh, and just, uh, I suppose it's symbolic, but I think it's a good symbol that we start to incorporate that in, in our major reports. We have 12 themes in the report. Um, many of them are the same as we've seen in the previous uh, five reports. Um, but of course, we now include an Indigenous chapter and extreme events. I'll talk to, uh, to that as we go on. Um, so many of the indicators uh, that we've heard about in the press are worse. And I'm going to give you just a very uh, quick snapshot of some of those indicators. But, um, but there are some good points. So we see a greater use of citizen science throughout the throughout the um, the report. We see better availability of data. Um, we try and highlight the importance of stewardship, 
Uh, meanwhile, we are also reporting on decline in, in ecosystem quality, uh, decline in uh, increase in number of invasive of introduced species as well as, uh, uh, as uh, threatened species. And again, as you've already heard many times already, uh, the, big, the big factors affecting environment and climate change, invasive species, habitat loss, uh, uh, and pollution um, in, in, and mining in some places. Some of the key indicators that have changed, um, as I've said, continuing uh, rapid change in climate. Uh, there, we, there has been a lot of chat about the clearing and, um, and I suppose one of the things that's problematic is, as the minister actually described, is we're not necessarily getting a handle on a good handle on where the clearing is and what those impacts are. So while uh, clearing it is not necessarily an issue everywhere, it can be an issue, and we're not actually um, managing to understand what those impacts are. We do know that indigenous uh, knowledge and connections to country are vital, and uh, and one of the things we've tried to do in this report is to include a whole lot more about how environmental decline affects the well-being of Australians. So in terms of stewardship, um, and here you see a picture of, of watering in a, in a swamp in Victoria, which comes from Green Finance. It's a Murray-Darling Basin Balanced Water Fund. But as you know, Landcare, I put it right at the top, but so many other uh, systems are increasing and are important in Australia. The Land for Wildlife Movement, uh, private land conservation, uh, green finance, uh, we're seeing a rise in natural capital investment. Caring for country activities, uh, which we know have uh, in, uh, are documented to have improved health and well-being outcomes for Indigenous people in Australia, and as all land care people know, the, that regenerative land management and land care volunteering is really good for you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I again I congratulate that, like the minister did, all land care activities, and I've got a picture right at the end to show uh, I'm starting to walk the talk. Uh, if I can, I'll just move to some of the findings. And, uh, and the extreme events chapter documents that, in fact, uh, we're seeing uh, larger and more extreme events in Australia. And perhaps if I could reflect the biggest change, if you, if you think from previous environment, uh, state of environment reports to the current one, is uh, in the past, we often talked about climate change impacts in the future tense. And now, throughout the report, we're documenting evidence in the present tense. So that's a, that's a big change. Um, when we talk about, um, in 2016, we talked about bleaching on the coral reefs, and we were talking about maybe every second year seeing significant bleaching events by 2030. And in fact, in the last six years, we've had three major bleaching events, possibly four. Um, so you're starting to see some of these, um, some of these impacts uh, are actually already occurring now. And Mark Howden touched on that yesterday. Um, the new chapter in, in the report uh, talks about the impacts of cyclones, storms, uh, marine and land heat waves, bushfires and floods. And of course, some of these impacts are also positive for the environment. So as you know, floods, which can be very detrimental to human um, human beings and our, and our um, infrastructure, but it also can have massive uh, positive flow on effects where we see um, in, increase in, in vegetation and major flushes of, of growth as well, and then big increases in bird populations. So, so yes, um, major impacts from extreme events, a lot negative, but also some positive. What we have seen is an increase in the variability and intensity of these extreme events. And so you're starting to see uh, negative uh, environmental as well as social impacts. As you know, as we as we've seen, people throughout Australia that have been impacted are, are pretty fed up and uh, and want action. Perhaps less well described is the destruction of Indigenous places and values by extreme events, and that is happening, and that is a, a, a great concern. And we do know that the modifications to the landscapes actually help exacerbate the impacts. So we know that by protecting the environment, we can actually start to uh, to to at least deal with some of those impacts. And as we know, we need management to deal with, with, those, with all of those impacts. Uh, I, don't, I won't spend too much time on climate because you've already heard um, from better experts than I, like Mark yesterday, 
but we do know that we've seen increases in uh, in the uh, terrestrial as well as the marine environment, uh, an increase of 1.5% in land on average in Australia over the last decade, about one degree in, in the ocean on average. Um, and these are starting to, to see changes to how the ecosystems respond. One of those impacts, of course, that comes from the increased temperature uh, has been bushfires. We know that the last decade was the hottest on record, 2019, the hottest and driest on record. We had, I think, six of the last nine years were records of hotness and dryness in Australia. And that led to simultaneous bushfires across multiple states. Um, and, um, and I'm sure you know better than I the impacts of that in terms of the destruction of bushland and the, and the, uh, and the, the death of, of billions of animals. So if I could, I'll just um, touch on some of the findings. And this, the first one here is uh, the land state and condition. Now, the general overall in Australia, the general assessment is that the landscapes and seascapes are in good condition but what I want you to look at is the arrows. So that's a deteriorating trend. So grade, the grade's good overall, but the, can, but the trend is, is getting worse. And when you look at, say, soils underneath it, uh, it's a, a, overall a condition of poor and, um, and a deteriorating trend. Now, we do know that regenerative agriculture techniques and uh, lots of people are doing lots to help improve soils, but we also know that lots of people aren't. So somehow improving the message and the outreach of land care um, and the like to, it, to improve uh, agricultural practices in particular will, will actually help to turn some of these trends around. If you look at ecosystems, uh, we know that uh, we have an overall assessment of poor and deteriorating. Now, some of that is, um, uh, is worse in different places. So this is across the whole of Australia. Some of our ecosystems are in relatively good condition, others in poor condition. Uh, and if you look at, say, the assessment there for the marine environment, marine and coasts are in a, a good and relatively stable condition, but we do see impacts, particularly in nearshore reefs. And, and I just mentioned the bleaching um, in the coral reefs of the Great, of the great Barrier Reef. Uh, so it, it is a mixed bag. The, the, the concerning element is generally the trend is deteriorating. And, and as I said before, management is key to this. Uh, uh, we know we need to have better investment, and I'm going to come to that shortly. Perhaps one thing I'd like to, to stress, and, and Minister Plibersek mentioned it just this morning, is about the coordination between our tiers of government. That comes across throughout the report as being ineffective, and actually stifling some of the work that needs to happen. So um, I, I was very pleased to hear Minister Pubasek say that she wants to address that in her, in her term as Environment Minister. In terms of spending, uh, this, is a, this is the amount of federal budget that's spent on the environment. There's two blips there in the blue line, the overall blue line at the top. You can see a big increase in 2017, which was the increase in funding that went to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. And then also back uh, again in uh, 2011, which was for uh, bushfire, um, bushfire work that, came, that was spending. Now, both of those uh, were one-off bits of funding, but in fact, overall, we've seen a decrease in the budget in, in environment. And if I just show you a graph uh, of funding, um, federal funding for biodiversity, the bottom line in dark blue is, uh, is land care. And we see a decrease in land care funding over the decade. I don't need to tell you, you've been living it for the last decade. A decrease in funding we're at, at a time when we know that the need is greatest. So a, a significant decrease in funding, and I do hope that that can be uh, redressed um, in, in, current, in, in future years. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out was uh, about protected areas and the growth of pr private protected areas. And you can see um, that we now have a, a larger number of um, private protected areas. That's been a growth area. Indigenous protected areas has also been a growth area um, over the last five years. But in fact, uh, government protected areas are uh, much less so, uh, and um, and perhaps that's a, that that there's an adjustment that needs to be made there. 
In terms of the, uh, the overall level of protection, this is a, a graph of what's called the IUCN six protected area categories. And, it, and this is over the course of, uh, of 30 years. Uh, you can see that um, uh, the level of, of highly protected areas in red is decreasing. Some of that is due to an increase in, uh, in multiple use protected areas. But we have also seen some areas um, uh, have had their designations reduced in some jurisdictions. I'd like to touch on heritage, uh, and one of the issues that comes up strongly in the in the in the State of Environment report and the heritage chapter is that our heritage laws are not working consistently across Australia. So heritage, of course, is natural heritage, which we deal with in land care and the like, but it's also indigenous heritage and historic heritage and geo heritage, and our laws uh, are not well combined. We have a, a national heritage strategy, which is great. But it's not been fully implemented since it's been uh, since it's been uh, set in place, and we're seeing um, uh, an inconsistent um, an inconsistent approach to heritage across Australia. You know, one of the worst examples that's highlighted in the report is the destruction of the Duke and Gorge, um, and um, in Western Australia, and that that uh, was a, a calamity which obviously had massive impact on Indigenous Australians, but actually on all Australians. I'm sure all of us uh, were are poorer for for the lack of protection of heritage through our through our legislative um, systems, and we do know that we need to fix those. In terms of some of the findings, the assessments, this is the her some headlines from the heritage chapter. Uh, we see that um, overall we have good but a declining uh, trajectory. So if you look at the, at the top, you'll see world heritage is generally considered in good condition, but a declining trajectory. But then when you go to some of the other elements like indigenous geo heritage, the actual assessment by a group of experts is that it's poor. Um, and when you look at the pressures that they identify uh, for that, um, this is a graph of pressures, um, uh, the largest graphs, um, the largest indicators are a lack of funding Resourcing for heritage conservation and management is low or, and in, in, inefficient. And then, in fact, climate change comes up as the next biggest impact affecting heritage overall. What we do know is that if we work together, we can actually start to make a difference. And of course, land care is uh, a, a, a primary example of that in Australia. And one of the things we did want to leave in the report is, is a sense of hope that we can actually improve things. Uh, we do know that there's an increase in the, in the importance of environmental, social and governance investment. And we're starting to see uh, a whole lot of private funding coming in, things like natural capital accounting, uh, triple bottom line reporting, uh, blended finance. And, and just yesterday, I, I visited a, a mine site where, where there's the potential for rehabilitation of both mined areas, ex um, uh, ex pine forest to be to be restored into banks of woodland, and when you see the combination of urban mining restoration uh, and some of the results uh, were very good. In fact, uh, you you do get heart that we can actually make a difference and turn things around. Um, the restoration economy is, is something which is actually uh, becoming more than just simply a, an academic exercise. We do, uh, we've talked a little bit about climate change in this conference, but we, do, we need to tackle both climate change and biodiversity loss at the same time uh, so that we get a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, but also restoration of nature. And uh, of all the places in the world, Australia is very well placed to actually to, to take best advantage from investment in restoration. What we do know we need, though, is standards and measurable targets to help inform those long-term practices, and that's a, a key issue that, we, that, that needs to come forward in the, in the next few years. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the National Environmental Science Program is also starting to do work. Um, the minister just mentioned an increase in Indigenous ranges. And we're looking to see how we can uh, work to get an increase in uh, monitoring that's actually um, able to be maintained and curated well. Uh, we need to do research that informs land stewardship. 
and restoration and, and an evaluation of our past restoration outcomes. And we've been working with the National Land Care Network uh, to, to actually find ways to do that in Australia. Um, and, uh, and I thank the, the National Land Care Network and Land Care Australia uh, for actually participating in NESP activities. Um, and one of the priorities, of course, is how do we deal with urban rivers? And, uh, and that's an, another area of work uh, that's coming forward in the, in the National Environmental Science Program. The Minister uh, talked about some of the, her, her new announcements. Um, we, we, the, the big one that came about was about protection of more of Australia's land and oceans. But some of the ones that underneath were around carbon and biodiversity, an increase in stewardship, uh, a focus on urban rivers, some great uh, announcements around increasing in Indigenous ranges, and hopefully that will also lead to better use of Indigenous knowledge um, and improvements in cultural water, which the, our, the State of the Environment report is, is pretty damning, actually, around um, how badly we've done around cultural water over the last five years. Uh, and an increase in protected area management and uh, improvements in, in the dealing with threatened species. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to hear that we'll be doing that on a regional basis. The minister mentioned that our uh, that the, the new government will respond to the Samuel review. That's very well um, received by all of us. Uh, and but underneath that, we know we need to improve national standards and targets. Um, we're pleased to hear about a national environmental protection authority, and and uh, for me, critical to that is getting our data streams. Uh, uh, together that will allow us to do the monitoring. One of the biggest issues for state of environment reporting is lack of data or lack of consistent data to be able to make those sorts of uh, analyses and to make them in a way that's much more um, uh, easy for people to access. So my vision would be to see state of environment reporting, which is easily accessed on a regional basis so that groups, land care groups can use it and be guided by it. I wanted to end on a picture. So this is um, a Cherry Tree Hill lookout in Tasmania. And when you look out there, you can see uh, national parks. So there's several national parks. There's a Ramsar listed lagoon. Uh, there's production. You can see some production lands in there. There are uh, There's multiple revolving fund properties uh, by the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. Uh, there's bush heritage reserves in there. So there's uh, several different uh, private protected areas. There's multitudes of land for wildlife um, um, uh, properties in there, people who are dedicating their private lands to protect wildlife. Um, what's missing from this picture, actually, is as far as I can tell, I couldn't find a land care group. So, so my, my challenge is that while this is a fantastic picture, it's still the exception and not the norm, uh, where we have an integrated land shape with integrated management that allows us to, to actually um, deal with threats on, on, a, on, a, on a regional basis. Um, and, and, um, and I personally would like to see an increase in land care groups right around Australia, including in Tasmania, my home state. So I wanted to thank you all for your time and attention. It's not all bad news. I've decided to walk the talk. So we've started to invigorate the Allens Rivulet and Sand for the I land care group and a big shout out to uh, Renee in the Kingbrook Council in Tasmania because she's helped us to get together. And just this weekend, we planted 60 trees along Allen's Rivulet uh, in, our, in our local land care group. Um, so it's, it's so important that land care continues and grows. And I just hope that we can see a change from the past decade of having to work um, with inadequate resources to one where land care is, is fully resourced and able to do the job that you do so well. Thank you very much.